Today, our speaker is uh, Douglas Clark, who's a barrister and author. He's uh, just uh, published a book on gunboat justice, British and American law courts in China and Japan. So he's here today to, to talk about gunboat justice. And uh, I, like, I like this first part of his introduction. He goes on to say the the 19th century unequal treaties that opened China, Japan, and Korea to the West exempted foreigners from local laws, leaving them to be tried by their own courts. And this system lasted for many decades in Japan and Korea, for an over a century in China, Britain and America even established formal court systems. Uh, Mr. Clark will tell the story of these courts and the many challenging issues they face, including war, riots, rebellion, corruption, murder, infidelity, and even a failed hanging. So, um, anyways, I think I'll let him tell you the rest of the story. So uh, please join me in welcoming Douglas Clark. Thank you very much, Wing. Wing was just telling me over lunch how he used to be a court reporter himself back in Vancouver um, and how that was his favourite job. So um, uh, as you, as Wing kindly put, point out in the introduction, I am a lawyer. Um, uh, I'm now a barrister in Hong Kong. For those who you all know in Hong Kong, we all wear the wigs and talk in court. Um, I used to be a solicitor um, here in Hong Kong first uh, in the 1990s and then I moved up to Shanghai uh, in the uh, 2000s and spent the whole 11 years in Shanghai practicing there in an international law firm. Um, and then many years before that, I studied at university in Shanghai. And even longer before that, I studied at high school in Japan. So Japan and China are my two favorite countries outside my home country, which is Australia. Um, uh, and uh, one day when I was actually between being a solicitor and becoming a barrister, I had a, about six months off and I was still going back and forth between Shanghai and Hong Kong. I was on the Bund and I saw this sign, which is on the old HSBC building, they're the grand building on the Bund. Um, uh, and this is the plaque that they've uncovered recently. I'm not sure exactly when they uncovered it. There was a long time where they didn't celebrate these things in China. But recently in Shanghai, they have been uncovering old plaques and, and showing them off and seeing what they have. Now, this one is on the HSBC building, opening it in 1923. Um, zooming in so you can read it a little bit better. Um, the first part is, of course, you see the, the, the good and the great there included Admiral Arthur Leveson, who was the commander-in-chief of the China Station. I'll come to the China Station in a second. You then had the Hong Kong Chief Justice, which is fair enough. Um, it represented the US Army from the Governor General in the Philippines. But what interested me, and I studied at university Chinese history and things, was this next reference to the Sir Skinner Turner, the judge of HBM Supreme Court for China. Now, at the time, I really didn't know what the Supreme Court for China was. I, I realised later I'd read some things about it, but I never understood it. What is the Supreme Court for China, and why is it an HBM is Her Britannic Majesties? What is that? What did it do, and, what did it, and, and how did it exist? That was where my journey started in 2011, and then I contacted Graham Earnshaw, who I'd been doing some other things with in, in Shanghai, I wrote Graham an email, I actually just looked up, said, I'm thinking of writing a very short book about this court, are you interested? Graham said, yeah, that would be fantastic, it's um, not really been written about, and you know, people know Graham publishes on China on, on many topics, so he kindly agreed to publish the book, unwritten and unpublished, anyhow, uh, unwritten and not yet thought out. Uh, anyhow, I did write a very quick book uh, in the period of time when I was not yet practising as a barrister, sent off about a 50,000 word book to Graham, who said very politely, because Graham's British, um, but I worked in a British law firm for a long time, so I understand what they mean. <laughs> he said pi very politely, crap. <laughs> but of course, he said it in a much more polite British way. It was longer and it said things. So, um, so we spent the next two years doing more investigations and I did more research and writing. The product is unfortunately this very large three volume tome. Um, not unfortunately, I loved writing it and it covers a lot, but it got to, 288,000 words, I think. Um, it may be a little bit more, but 288,000 sounds good. Um, covering the whole history of British and American extraterritoriality in China. 
So what was this and what was the Supreme Court for China? That was the question I started with. Um, and I found out as I did the investigation. Now, to add to the, the, the first thing, is many, many of you, I didn't know about this, may not know what the China Station was either. The China Station can actually be seen in that photograph there in the corner, um, the old view from the um, uh, FCC headquarters. That was the British boats in harbour in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was the centre of the British Navy in China and the Pacific, and it was called the China Station, and it was headquartered here in Hong Kong. The China Station at its peak was probably the second largest navy in the world if you treated it as a separate navy. Why? Because their gunboats had to sail up and down the China coast, keeping the Chinese under control when they complained about foreigners running around China and having rights in China, which came from the Opium War and the Treaty of Nanking. That's Lin Zexu and Henry Pottinger, who later became governor of um, Hong Kong. The first treaties, um, actually the Treaty of Nanking and the Treaty of Wangsha, the American side, set up extraterritoriality. And that said, very simply, we're coming to live in your country. You don't like it, but we're coming to live in your country. Um, your legal system is not very good, so we're going to have our own legal systems look after ourselves. And the Chinese actually didn't object to that to begin with. It made sense. They didn't know how to deal with foreigners. Just let the foreigners live in their little, their little territories and they'll deal with themselves and we'll deal with ourselves and everyone will be happy. And it actually worked like that for a little while. Um, the next country that uh, the Americans actually went and opened up, the British did China with the uh, Opium Wars. The Americans opened Japan um, in 1856 with the black ships, if you know Japanese history. Um, Japan was equally closed. Um, and the same sort of provisions were included for law and treaty ports were opened up in cities that we all know now, very famous cities, Yokohama, Kobe, Nagasaki, and a few other cities that became major ports. The big difference between China and Japan is after the Opium Wars, China just didn't change. They stayed the same for the next 70 years until the end of the Qing um, dynasty. Japan, on the other hand, and this bombardment of Kagoshima I have here was a very important time in Japan. Um, this is the British, actually, destroying Kagoshima because a, a Japanese samurai killed a British man outside Yokohama. The samurai was from Kagoshima. They demanded he be handed over for punishment or be punished. The Japanese refused. So the, Japanese, so the British then destroyed Kagoshima um, uh, very violently, as you can see. They, the, the Japanese had no defence. Those ships just sailed back and forward, um, shelling the city to, to, to ruins. But this resulted in the Japanese reforming. And they said, OK, we're... We can't beat these guys. There was a civil war in Japan, reformers won, and Japan then it started reforming very, very quickly, bringing in a Western legal system and then becoming a great power of its own. And this, those two stories, to begin with, run in parallel, and then at the end, they intersect. When Japan became so strong, they ended up invading China. And that's what the story then leads on to. Anyhow, just to give you a quick feeling of what extraterritoriality was, that's it in layman's term. Effectively, it means that foreigners were taken to their own courts for any crime or civil action. China and Japan, and later Korea, I don't really talk about Korea much, but it was the same there. China and Japan had no jurisdiction over foreigners, none at all. All they could do was arrest them and take them to their authorities for them to be tried or for civil cases. So there are 18 countries, which basically covered the whole world, because if you're British, that included Australians, Canadians, um, Hong Kong Chinese got a special treatment, which um, I don't get it, can't talk about today, but because there's an issue of dual nationals, you have some issues there. Um, South Africans were all British. Americans covered everyone, including Philippine, people from the Philippines. There were Mexican courts. There were Peruvian courts, if I remember. German, Austro-Hungarian, and everything. So at one point in Shanghai, which had the main system, there were actually 21 courts operating in Shanghai. Um, so if you're British, you went to the British court, anyone here who's American would have gone to the American court, Germans to the German court and other people like that. It was a bit of a mess. Um, of course, for lawyers, it's a good thing because messes uh, always make us money. Um, one man who features a lot in the book is this gentleman, Sir Edmund Hornby. Um, he was the first chief judge of the British Supreme Court and set the whole system up. Um, and I made a lot of effort in the book, and if you, if you have a look at it, there's over 200 cartoons from the time. These are all contemporaneous cartoons of the people drawn in various journalistic uh, newspapers and, 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 and magazines. So Sir Edmund Hornby was one of the fathers of extraterritoriality. I'll talk about him in just a second. He had this to say at one point after a case, and this is coming to the gunboats and why I called it gunboat justice. Um, 
Of course, I never tried another British subject accused of killing a Chinaman at an outlying port and this was a gunboat at hand. Why he had had to do that? In one case, the British person, in this case, the British person had been acquitted and the Chinese surrounded the court and then surrounded his house, threatening him. So he had to call in a gunboat, which then landed troops and scared the Chinese off and protected the court. And there were a number of other occasions when this happened. It was not just easy acquiescence necessary from the Chinese people. There were times when the gunboats were actually literally called in to protect judges in the court. Um, the courts that did exist, um, there were consular courts, which are other countries, but these courts were established. The Br British Supreme Court for China and Japan, which was established by Hornby. There was a branch in Yokohama for a little while there, as I have there. There was a court for Japan in Yokohama that existed right up to 1900 when um, Japanese, uh, Japanese got rid of extraterritoriality. They developed their legal system to the point where they could get rid of it uh, with the foreign powers agreeing. And then there was a United States District Court for China that opened in 1906, uh, operating in China. Until then, the Americans had consular courts. Just to give you an idea, here is a picture of the British Supreme Court in Shanghai. If you know Shanghai, that's at the very top of the Bund. If you look at the other photograph, the British consulate that you see at the top of the Bund, the front part was the consulate, the back part was actually the courthouse. So we're looking there at the courthouse. It's not a great picture uh, in the 1930s. And you have the um, Broadway mansions, then you have the Russian consulate where there's a Russian court, of course. You have the American consulate where there's American court, and then you have the Japanese consulate where there's a Japanese court as well. Um, but that's what it looked like. And there's an original picture of the building built by Sir Edmund Hornby as well. It wasn't very big. They only had one courtroom to begin with, a very, very big courtroom, um, probably 1.5 size times this room. Um, then they built some other courts a little bit later on, which you can see in the other earlier photo on the right-hand side where some other courts were built. And there's the only picture I've ever been able to find of inside the courtroom. Um, as you can see, they're enjoying some wine and sherry. Um, they were, and it was actually a cartoon. The case was about the quality of sherry, um, and that shows the court. So it looks just like a British court. You've got a judge up there in his, in his, in his, in his um, wig. You've got barristers in wigs. Um, the only difference is solicitors were allowed to appear. So you have one solicitor there appearing without his wig, um, and you have uh, a clerk of the court and everything. Um, and so it operated just like a British court in China which, when it was cases between British people, was fine. It helped build Shanghai, it helped because you know, the whole bund there is British. And that was built because the British could do contract with each other and build things. They didn't have to do anything to do with the Chinese legal system. So it contributed a lot to the development of Shanghai as, and, and the other treaty ports as, as, a, as commercial centers because British people just dealt with British people. Or Americans could sue British people in the British courts or British could sue Americans in the, in the American courts. There's a picture of the United States Court for China. This is actually on circuit, not the actual courtroom, but they, they used to go on circuit around China to try cases. This is, I believe, but I can't be sure, in Tianjin. You have the judge there, the US flag, and some lawyers sitting in there uh, in the courtroom with some uh, Marine guards. That's why I think it's in Tianjin. I think the Marine guards were, were guarding it in Tianjin. Um, I won't read that, but why did the US court get set up? Because of the laxness of extraterritoriality, if you didn't have it. If you read down the very bottom of the quote, it got to the point where the Secretary of St for State told the American president that American girls are synonymous with prostitutes in China. So they would call them a, an American girl if you're talking about getting a prostitute. They didn't like that, so they set up the US court for China to try and bring more rigor into the system, which succeeded as well in the long run. This is another cartoon from inside the US Court for China. Uh, a very interesting judge, uh, Lebius Wilfley, he, he changed the whole nature of the court when he set it up, disbarred most of the lawyers practicing before the court, um, and then went after the prostitutes as well. Um, not personally, <laughs> maybe he did, I don't know, but he, he did his best to get them, run them out of town so that the American girls were no longer synonymous. Um, I do want to say a very good thanks to any of the journalists here in the room because I could only write this book, and if you read it, you'll see I have numerous quotes from court cases, numerous quotes from what people actually said, mainly because of the North China Herald, um, which published transcripts of almost every case in the British court and most of them in the American court. Um, it was basically reality TV of the time. You could go into court, you could take down the case, and you could, you know, dig into deep people's dirty, dirty underdoings. But it was fantastic for me because I was able to um, uh, uh, read the transcripts and write up the cases 
as good as you could ever get from having been there. Um, and you don't get to write history like that normally. You've got to piece it together from lots of different things. So the cases I actually wrote about, I could get into right into the actual things that were going on. Um, just point out the journalism wasn't always that good. Um, firstly, you'll see this report of a Peking massacre confirmed in 1900. That was following the Boxer Rebellion. In fact, um, there was no massacre in Peking. Well, not, not of foreigners. This was reporting the massacre of foreigners. There was actually a massacre of the Chinese, but they weren't interested in that back in the UK. Um, this is a massacre of the foreigners being reported. Um, they were not slain, as it says there on it. Um, but this did actually lead to a number of cases in the court. So um, there's a defamation case because one, one journalist said um, this journalist made it up. The journalist sued for defamation and they had the whole fight in court, like journalists do. They love um, going to court if they can. And it's old-style journalism. They would defame people on purpose so that you could have court cases to hear about them, and there was a number of those. One other journalist I'll mention um, is Thomas Bethel, um, who actually deserves a medal because um, Japan, as I said, had grown stronger and stronger with its reforms. It actually beaten China in a war in 1895, imposed extraterritoriality on China. It beaten Russia in a war in 1905, if you know the history. Bethel went to Korea in 1905 during that war. By that point, Japan had occupied Korea but not annexed it yet. So there's actually a Japanese government in Korea and a Korean government in Korea. So extraterritoriality still existed. So Thomas Bethel became the publisher of a number of anti-Japanese newspapers in Korea because he had extraterritorial rights. The Japanese could not prosecute him or go after him. So the Japanese made the British prosecute him, which they did. Um, first, he was given a good behaviour bond. They then passed a special law to say that he shouldn't be public. Well, they, they didn't say Thomas, Thomas Bethel himself, but they said people shouldn't be exciting enmity with the Korean government. Uh, prosecuted him for that in Seoul, so the court went over to Seoul to try him. Um, and then uh, he was convicted and he spent three weeks of jail in Shanghai um, for that. And the Koreans, to this day, think of him as a hero. They've had many ceremonies and they have a big, big um, uh, statue to him at his grave in Korea. So that was one journalist who, um, who was, uh, became quite famous in the time for fighting the, uh, uh, the Japanese. So... How did the courts contribute to modern Japan and modern China? Um, first, um, what was their role in, the, in, 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 in developing the rule of law? Um, in fact, quite interestingly, the British established the, the uh, British Supreme Court for China because they were having troubles with the Hong Kong Supreme Court because it was a, the Hong Kong Supreme Court was the appellate court for all the consular courts in China and Japan. And a number of occasions, the Hong Kong court would acquit people, or in one case, they even punished the British minister in Japan for exceeding his powers. So the Times actually called it the greatest nuisance in the East. So they weren't a favor, in favour of the rule of law coming from the Hong Kong Supreme Court. Nevertheless, Edmund Hornby, who um, set up the court, um, said he wanted to show how necessary it was to entirely separate the judicial from the executive and administrative authority. Um, and he did that in the Orders in Council, making himself the boss of the court and the British minister couldn't report to him. It did lead to one conversation he recorded in his autobiography, which is quite interesting. He was speaking to Prince Kung, um, who was in charge of the... Uh, Chung -la, uh, Zhongli Yaman, which is the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the minister asked him, if you're... Uh, sorry, the... Prince Kung asked him, if the minister gives you an order, would you follow it? Hornby said, no, I wouldn't. Um, and then he said, well, what if the Queen gives you an order? He says, I'm not going to follow that. Um, then Prince Kung said, well, then you're all powerful. You're in your capacity of judge above not only the minister, but also above the sovereign. To which Hornby responded, no, not so. I am simply the mouthpiece of the law, which according to our system rules alike sovereigns and ministers. So that was um, what he said. Prince Kung didn't quite understand that because a couple of years later, a British police, a British customs officer in Guangzhou was uh, killed a boy in a, in, a, in a riot, shot him. He was tried for murder in Guangzhou in the British court. The British Supreme Court came down to Guangzhou, or Canton as it was then, um, tried him. He was convicted of manslaughter, um, and the judge thought he should have been convicted of murder, made that very clear. But the Chinese didn't like that. They said, no, he should have been convicted of murder. So Prince Kung himself, who Hornby had given this lesson to, um, effectively demanded that Logan be retried and then executed. 
because he said, if it, it having originated in murder, an investigation of the circumstances of the right should be the objective point. These circumstances being correct, the guilty party should be punished according to their deserts. So Prince Kun hadn't quite understood what the rule of law was about, and as I comment in the book, that seems to be the point of um, many Chinese officials to this day don't quite understand that there is um, a separation between the judiciary and the executive, even some recent comments that came up in Hong Kong recently. It was never really understood in China until after the Qing dynasty fell, um, and I'll get on to that in just a second. It was clearly understood in Japan, which developed a Western legal system straight away, which remains in place to this day um, and helped Japan to grow strong and remain strong all the time. China did catch up. The 1911 revolution got rid of the Manchu run Ling dynasty. A legal system was introduced, but then China fell into chaos. Um, Yuan Shikai became emperor, if you know that. Um, and then it took 15 years before they could sort themselves out again. And you then ended up with the Guomindang coming to power. Um, and in five years, they actually did a lot. This is something that people don't appreciate from Chinese history. The Guomindang did a huge amount. They occupied the whole country. They took over the whole of the government. They introduced numerous laws in that period of time. And in fact, so well, in 1931, Britain actually agreed to end extraterritoriality in China with the Guomindang. Not just because their legal system was good enough, but because they were so military powerful. They said, quite frankly, we can't fight them anymore, so we're going to have to reach an agreement. However, Japan came back into the story at this point because they invaded Manchuria. Um, and Japan had been got stronger than Guomindang, and they were quite e easily able to invade Manchuria. They also had a big battle around Shanghai to push the Chinese troops back and developed a cordon sanitaire around Shanghai, allowing foreigners the freedom there. You then had 1937 when Japan invaded China, the whole of China, or not whole of China except for the, the whole eastern seaboard. Um, and strangely, extraterritoriality continued in Shanghai and those other regions and actually the whole of China because Japan didn't quite want to bring it to an end. They didn't want a war with um, Britain or America yet. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm almost done. So. <laughs> Um, then 1939, you actually get to the darker times because the, the Japanese are so strong in China, they were willing to start fighting the British and, and other people. Um, they blockaded Tianjin when they wanted some um, suspects handed over. They'd set up a puppet government in Tianjin. Um, some Chinese killed one of the uh, Chinese members of the puppet government. They wanted to um, get these individuals and try them and then execute them, as they did. Um, but it actually ended up with a case in the courts. The courts had to get involved with this. There's a habeas corpus application where the, um, there's an application in the court in Shanghai to release these people because they weren't being properly detained. It was rejected. It then actually went to the, there was another application in London um, where, in fact, the Solicitor General himself turned up, the Solicitor General's second most senior law officer in, in, in Britain, and actually said the war had already started in Europe. He said, whose army? or whose navy is going to get these guys out. We're fighting a war here in Europe. We don't have any military capability to extract four Chinese from Tianjin if you, if you want me to bring them to London. The applications failed and the people were executed. Um, but this is the sort of cartoons that were going on at the time, showing even Britain being locked into their concession in Tianjin. Um, same in Shanghai, Hankou, uh, the, the north part of Shanghai was shut off by the Japanese. No one could go through. You see that in some movies at the time um, of people being un unable to cross through and they're making demands. Um, so it be, it's very clear that even though the British still had some rights, the Japanese were asserting their rights much more strongly. It then all came to an end very quickly. Um, when the Pacific War started um, in uh, 1941, uh, there was actually only one British gunboat left in China, and it didn't even have a gun on it, so it was just a boat. Um, but it was it went, went down in good British tradition because the Japanese boarded it under, under a flag of truce, said, surrender. The British lieutenant in charge, a man called Polkinghorne, said, get off my bloody ship. Um, the Japanese then opened up from their big ship that was in Shanghai called the Izumo, um, which is a little bit bigger than a gunboat, and sank... The, way, um, the, the British gunboat in harbour, and that was the end. The judges and staff were then interned. There was still one or two courts operating in Kunming and Chong Chongqing, which is Free China, and then it was finally abolished in 1943. Um, some messages for today. If you look at Japan's development from here, 
The rule of law was very fundamental to its quick development. It adopted early and fast. China did not. It didn't do lots of things, but it certainly didn't adopt any type of rule of law, and it was weakened. Since 1978, China's been very interesting. It's actually been following Japan's 19th century playbook, if for want of a better word. Um, economic reform, development of industries, development of railways, high-speed rail, et cetera, things. They've modernised the legal system. It's, it's much better than it used to be, and I practice there, so I can tell you. But there is no rule of law. And that's going to be the real question. What is going to happen in China now? Because they're getting to the point of, of, of economic development, I believe you really need proper rule of law, not just some courts that function. What have you learned from extraterritoriality? I say in the conclusion of my book, what China learned from extraterritoriality is quite simple. If you go to Tiananmen Square and look up at Tiananmen Gate, there's two slogans. The first is, long live Chairman Mao. Now, I know no one in China really wants him to be back alive because they would be all up against the wall, as they say. But the other slogan is, unity is strength. And that's actually the main message of the Communist Party today. The foreigners came here and tried to split China. The only way we can fight the foreigners is by unity. And that explains actually why the Communist Party has stayed in power for so long, because they, that is their single most solid message. And I have to say myself, I didn't appreciate it till I wrote this book, how badly the foreigners did treat China. All over the place, foreigners and Japanese, we were appalling. So they have, they don't even need propaganda, they can just tell the truth and that's enough to, to unite their people. There's one final message which I have here, which is a message from Japan to China. I mentioned the Izumo, which is that boat there. That boat sat in Shanghai for about 10 years, being the source of all British naval power in, in China, shelling Shanghai, shelling British. China built, bought an aircraft carrier from Ukraine, 1989, took them 10, 20 years to get it operational. Japan built this aircraft carrier themselves in two years, didn't have to buy it from Ukraine. And what did they call it? The Izumo. Now, if you don't understand what Japan's message is from that, um, I don't think I need to, to pass it on. Anyhow, there are some messages from t for today from the book, um, and I hope you enjoy it um, if you get a chance to read it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. And now I think we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, Doug, you could stay up there. Or oh, sit yeah. Down. I'll stay up here for a second. Okay. Easy. So, uh, uh, could you wait for the microphone and then give your name, okay? Yeah, this gentleman here, the white shirt. Hi, uh, Nick Thompson, no affiliation. Um, is that right that, uh, was it Sun Yat-sen was uh, arrested at the behest of the Vietnamese or the Chinese in Hong Kong and he was actually released? Ho Chi Minh was arrested. Sorry, Ho Chi Minh. Sorry, it's Ho, Ho Chi Minh. Minh. It's a little bit off topic. Yeah. Sun Yat-sen was arrested, was, was detained in the British, uh, in the Chinese embassy in London, but never arrested in Hong Kong. He was based here in Hong Kong, though. So. Right, but did, did that come under extraterritorial? No, no, that was straight Hong Kong. No, that was straight Hong Kong court that right. released him in the end of the day. Okay. One more there. Uh, Got to ask this somewhat silly question. That's 19 letters, extraterritoriality. Can, Can you play that on a Scrabble board, number one? <laughs> number two, I don't think you think we can. But number two, what did the Chinese learn about it? I've heard somewhere that certain major Chinese interests have attempted to have their own, shall we say, jurisprudence or court control where they have heavy investments in Africa and South America. Is that true? Um. They'll certainly want to get a different jurisdiction than the local African or other things. It's one of those areas of contract law. We all, that's why we have arbitration clauses. I'm sure they're asking for Chinese law if they can get it. Um, that's what everyone does. They try to get their own legal system if you can. Um, and no one agrees to it. So it, it's a sort of extraterritoriality, but not a direct one. One more there? Uh, the um, oh. gentleman over there. Oh, okay, over there first. Yeah. Over there. Brief question. During this period when all these different countries had their own courts, what happened when there was a conflict between two different foreigners in terms good, of jurisdiction? And good question. The, the, the simple rule um, is, um, uh, is you always go to the defendant's court. So you always sue and defendant so, and no counterclaims. So if I have a dispute with an, uh, an American, let's say I was British, I have a dispute with an American, and we both have claims against each other, I'd have to sue the American in the American court, and the American would have to sue me in the British court. But there is one case that was absolutely unbelievable, and I've actually 
marked it up. Let me see if I can just find it now for you. Uh, because it could, it could become incredibly, incredibly complex. And this is, I'll just read you a little bit of it, maybe not all of it, but um, um, in one case, Dent & Co, a large British trading firm, filed for bankruptcy. Dent & Co had borrowed money from a French bank, Bank de l'Indochine, for onward payment to a silk mill. After the bankruptcy, the silk mill repaid the money to Dent & Co's Chinese comprador, who then paid the money to the International Mixed Court. So that dealt with Chinese cases, the International Mixed Court. The comprador then brought an action to the International Mixed Court to have the rival claims to the money resolved. The bank brought an action against the comprador in the French mixed court. So there's a French mixed court as well dealing with that, um, to seek recovery of the money. The international mixed court transferred the money to the French mixed court. The French mixed court ruled it did not have jurisdiction and transferred the money to the British Supreme Court. For technical reasons, the bank de Lindersheim became a defendant in the British court. Therefore, you couldn't sue it in the British court. You'd have to take it over to the French court. But <laughs> because of these problems, there was a special rule. If your consul consented, you could still be sued in another court. And so the, Brit the French consul actually consented to that going on in the Supreme Court. But you get those sort of jurisdictional problems all the time. And cases are decided differently. One case in Japan where um, a British person won in the British court and a Japanese won in the Japanese court. And, you know, they said, OK, well, tough. Uh, gentleman there. Um, Yes, I want to ask you, how, how were the foreign courts paid for? Were they paid for by fees levied or uh, fines the court collected or the consulars and embassies paid for them? Or, or how were they financed? The, paid for the, they were part of the consular establishment. So at the end of the day, the budget was from London for the British court and, and you know, Washington for the US court. They were actually part of the, the consular establishment, but as a foreign office judicial service. Um, the British court itself paid for itself mainly by a 3% levy on probate. So whatever assets were recovered in probate, they took 3%. That was their main source of funding. But that was, if that didn't cover it, it was topped up by, by, by budget from London. And the Americans, I think, introduced the same system in the end. You had your hand up a few times. Hi, um, can you describe a bit about the research process and sources yeah. for the book? Yeah, the research process was, was great. Um, and to be frank, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I really uh, thought, OK, I want to write about this book. There wasn't much written on it. I found Hornby's book, which gave me some stuff. And then I just went down to the library in Shanghai and started going through the North China Herald and the North China Daily News and found the court cases there. So I thought, okay, this is fantastic. I then got lucky and found the North China Herald is actually online, so I could start researching the cases online. But literally, I read thousands of cases to work out the best ones to tell the story here. Um, and I got a lot out of the newspapers. The other thing that was um, brilliant is, by sheer luck, the archives of the British court still exist to this day. Um, and they're all in London at the, at the National Archives. Why do they still exist to this day? They were sitting in the court, um, and then at the end of extraterritoriality, Britain agreed to keep its records for 10 years. So in 1943, they agreed to keep it for 10 years. After the World War II finished, they came back to Shanghai. The records were still there sitting in the court. Then the 1949 revolution came along. Britain stayed in the consulate. They never had actually an agreement, but they stayed in the consulate until 1967. Um, and the records just stayed there. I think no one thought, nowhere to send them, nowhere, nothing to do with them. Um, the Red Guards actually occupied the consulate in 1967, but presumably with orders not to destroy anything, just occupy it and kick the British out. And in 1984, when Britain and China re-established um, diplomatic relations, the Chinese found these records, and I guess because it was a time of good friendship and comity and you know, showing goodwill, they sent it all back to um, England. So I spent a lot of time in the, in the archives in England, probably two weeks in total, just reading the old files and things to get out the information. The one other place I found a really useful source, is, and I tried to personalise the book a lot, was one of the judges left his personal papers, and they were in uh, Ireland, in Northern Ireland, in Belfast. So I went through his personal papers as well, which was very useful for extracting some of the, the real personal stuff. Finally, I did actually track down quite a few family members who were able to give me a little bit of personal information about stuff. And on the US court, one other person, Eileen Scully, has written a great book about the US court, so I was able to rely on a lot, a lot of her research for that. But the US court papers have disappeared, and they were in the British consulate as well. The Americans transferred them to the British consulate to look after them. Now, whether the British burnt them, or the Chinese burnt them, or whatever, no one knows, but they've, they've disappeared. Um, but 
now I have to say online research is so much easier, it's made it much, much easier to, to go in, but you still have to read the cases, unfortunately, which is tough. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, uh, there are a couple of movies in there, I think, as well. <laughs> so we should talk. <laughs> um, a couple of questions. Did the courts um, actually employ any Chinese people as clerks or, or whatever? I'm not talking about, you know, cleaning stuff and, you know, yeah. people who serve drinks and stuff. Simple uh, answer is no. No, okay. Um, on, on, at the end of the, I can tell you, at the end of uh, the report on the occupation by the Japanese, the, the British judge wrote a list of all the staff members and at the very bottom was... Rickshaw Cooley, name unknown. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and did, the, did the Chinese uh, citizen ever win in a civil claim against a foreigner in any of these courts? Yes, they did. And they actually, I mean, the judges strive to be fair, so they, they did win, but it's still amazingly difficult to win because if you're Chinese or Japanese with a claim, you have to go to a court and have a case, go to a foreign lawyer to try a case in English, never in your local language. There were interpreters, but in English, and then you know, try and succeed in that. So you had the hurdles for winning were very high in the first place. But yes, they did. When they went there, they, they, they hired British lawyers and fought the cases and went in and win. And, and they did win cases. And people were convicted of killing Chinese sometimes. It created often of manslaughter because the British had juries and the juries just wouldn't convict for murder of killing Chinese in most cases. But they did have, and they did occasionally, but mainly it was, uh, they'd be knocked down to manslaughter um, sometimes. It wasn't a completely unfair system. They did try to make it fair, but you know, there were problems, there's no doubt about it. And, and if I may, one, one last uh, supplementary. Um, and did you find any Chinese sources, like Chinese publications from the, at the time that uh, discussed any of these cases? I looked, I looked, um, I didn't, f there are some, they're much harder to track down. Um, there's very little written in Chinese on this. I mean, I found a thesis, um, which I thought was going to be a gold mine. I thought, okay, someone's written a PhD thesis on this, and it wasn't a gold mine at all. It was just sort of a, a very superficial review of these things existed. Um, I would love to, and uh, to be frank, I didn't have the time to go and dig into the Japanese and Chinese sources as much as I'd like to, and I didn't know where to find them, but there certainly will be stuff in the Chinese newspapers um, if you really wanted to spend time, and I hope someone who has the capability would go and do that as well. Yeah, Paul Schulte, this is great, I'm gonna buy your book. So if we go back in time, would locals have seen this court system as sort of a damnable imperial humiliation, or would they have seen a sense of pragmatism that people need to conduct business and we need you know, uh, appropriate arbitration, neutral objective arbitration entities? Where, where uh, do you come down? If you read what people write, including the Japanese right now, it was, it was an unfair system, which, which it was. At the time, I don't think it, w I think it was just one of those things that existed after a while. And, and it, it, the, the, Jap the Japanese certainly wanted to get rid of it um, from the 1890s onwards, and there was huge local movements to get rid of it. And the Chinese certainly from the 1930s, in the early 1930s, as I mentioned, there's a strong movement to abolish it. Um, and it was, became one of the big things that this is very unfair that foreigners are not subject to our system. Um, what people actually thought I haven't been able to dig into. They certainly didn't like the criminal cases where people were acquitted or, 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 not, or, or convicted of lesser offences. There certainly was an outrage at those sort of things, including one um, uh, where a case where some British policemen threw a beggar in the river and drowned him in, in the cold river. One Chinese newspaper wrote, when we read the decision, it's, of course it was a jury decision, so nothing to read, but when we read the decision, it will probably say he drowned because he couldn't swim. Yeah. Um, they were pretty cynical about it. The Japanese had a problem with drowning too because a British boat sunk, killing 26 Japanese, and that became a big problem when the captain was first cleared by a naval inquiry board and then only convicted of manslaughter and given three months in jail. So um, there were certain cases that became touch points. In terms of the civil jurisdiction, um, certainly people sued in the courts and they did come to the courts, and there were cases where they said, yes, they clearly preferred to try, try the courts. So I don't have enough information to say what they really, really thought about it. I think we've got time for one more question. Oh, okay, two, these two there. Just as a follow-on to um, the, the, the previous question, I wonder if you could comment on the future of extraterritoriality, particularly in commercial law, and I speak from the, the point of view of a banker where so many of our financial contracts 
um, are written with reference to the law of New York, the law of England, um, but it's, it's quite difficult to have it referred to the law of Japan, law of China, uh, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I thought you were going to ask about the more difficult thing for bankers, which is the long arm of US justice system, the Chinese justice system, poking around in your client's bank accounts, which is a real extraterritoriality. Um, contractual terms have always been there. Um, the, one of the big problems that I didn't mention, I was going to mention, is China doesn't allow you to enforce foreign judgments. So they've locked off their system so much, partly as a result of extraterritoriality. Sometimes you have to choose Chinese law because they won't let you use a foreign law unless you arbitrate, um, and arbitration makes that. Um, extraterritoriality is making a big comeback. You're finding all these criminal sanctions against people for tax evasion, terrorist financing, uh, pedophile activity. Many countries are expanding their own extraterritoriality. But it is slightly different because they don't have the courts in the actual country. Um, but they're saying, we can catch you if you're a citizen. So um, it, it's going to be growing and growing, I think. And if you're a banker, I wouldn't want to be a banker, frankly. It's tough. <laughs> okay, the last question, that gentleman in the far corner. Uh, Angus Forsyth, no affiliation. Did the armed forces of the various settlement powers have their own court martial system, which ran in parallel with the civil jurisdiction that they opposed? Um, they did. The, 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 uh, the military could always um, discipline their own if they wanted to, but in serious cases, they actually did hand over soldiers for prosecution. There was um, a, a number of cases where, um, one in Canton, where a, uh, actually an Afghani soldier was handed over for prosecution. He ended up being prosecuted in the Hong Kong Supreme Court because he was in Canton. It was too unstable at the time. He was convicted and hung, um, hanged, sorry. Um, and another time in, in Shanghai, towards the very end, a British soldier was also handed over for prosecution for murder and convicted, but not hanged. Um, and he actually probably did well because he ended up going back to England to serve his sentence when, when war started. Um, so the, 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 the armies certainly could and did most of the time uh, prosecute their own, which is what they'd still do worldwide. But um, they could also, um, uh, if they wanted to, hand them over to the civil courts for, for prosecution. And they did from time to time. I'm sorry, I just wanted to finish one point which came from Cliff there. You asked about research into Chinese documents in particular. I have to say that the biggest problem with research in Chinese documents, anything written before 1911, is to me incomprehensible. I actually found newspapers with translations and tried to read them. I couldn't work out even where it was. The Chinese language has changed so much, you can't actually read the... I'll have to go and learn how to read that type of Chinese as well. Japanese is much easier, but the Chinese is much harder. Okay, on behalf of the FCC, I thank you all for coming, and we'll see you again, I'm sure. Thank you to our thank speaker. You.